All right, let's dive into a technology that is no joke, set to completely rewrite the rules of computation as we know it, quantum computing. We're gonna look at its mind-bending power, its one huge weakness, and the global race to build a machine that can, well, that can simulate reality itself. And you know, it all kicked off with a simple, kind of frustrated demand from one of history's greatest physicists. Everything really starts right here. Back in the early 80s, the physicist Richard Feynman had this incredible light bulb moment. He realized that our normal computers, you know, the ones built on simple ones and zeros, could never ever truly simulate the universe. Why? Because the universe itself just isn't that simple. It's, well, it's quantum. And he famously said, nature isn't classical, damn it. That was the starting gun. If we wanted to really understand nature, we had to build a computer that spoke eight's language. We had to build a quantum computer. So how in the world do you build one? Well, it all starts by rethinking the most fundamental piece of a computer. We have to move way beyond that simple on-off switch. And this is where we meet the hero of our story, the Quibit. Okay, this is the core difference right here. A classical bit, the thing that runs everything from your watch to a supercomputer, it's basically a light switch. It's either off, a zero, or it's on, a one. That's it. A qubit, on the other hand, is more like a dimmer switch. Yeah, it can be zero or one, but it can also be a blend of both states at the exact same time. It's this wild ability to exist in this whole spectrum of states that just unlocks an exponentially bigger playground for doing calculations. This totally unique nature gives the qubit two incredible superpowers, and these are the source of all its potential. But as you're about to see, all that power comes with a really serious catch. Superpower number one is superposition. We just touched on it. By holding this weird combination of both zero and one, just a handful of qubits can explore a massive number of possibilities all at once. I mean, get this, just 300 qubits in superposition can represent more states than there are atoms in the entire observable universe. It's just a staggering, mind-melting expansion of computing power. Superpower number two is entanglement, and this, this is where things get really weird and really, really powerful. You can link two or more qubits together so that their fates are completely intertwined. If you measure one and find out it's a zero, you instantly know its entangled partner is a one. It doesn't matter if it's a millimeter away or across the galaxy. This deep, kind of spooky connection lets qubits perform these complex coordinated calculations that are just flat out impossible for classical bits. So let's recap. We've got these amazing superpowers, right? Existing in multiple states at once and being mysteriously linked across any distance. Sounds totally unbeatable, doesn't it? Well, all of that incredible power comes at a price, a fatal flaw. The quantum state is unbelievably, ridiculously fragile. To really get how fragile, just think about the computer or phone you're using right now. It makes about one uncorrected error for every quadrillion operations. That's a one with 15 zeros. It is so reliable that for all practical purposes, it's perfect. Now, let's look at the qubit, the tiniest vibration, a stray magnetic field from a nearby wire, even a minuscule change in temperature, what scientists just call noise, can cause its delicate quantum state to collapse. This process is called decoherence, and the result? Error rates that are millions, even billions of times higher than a classical computer. This noise, this is the central villain of our story. It's the dragon that we have to slay. And that brings us right to today. The thing is, we haven't slain that dragon of noise. Not yet. Instead, we're actually learning to live with it. So welcome to what's known as the Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Era, or NISQ for short. The term NISQ, which was coined by physicist John Preskill, it just perfectly describes where we are right now. We've got these machines with hundreds, even over a thousand qubits. They're powerful enough to do some things that classical computers struggle with, but they're just too error-prone for the really big, complex quantum algorithms. So how do we get any useful work out of these powerful but, you know, imperfect machines? The answer is teamwork. We use these clever hybrid algorithms where a classical computer and a quantum processor work together. Think of it like a conversation. The classical computer makes an educated guess and tells the quantum computer, hey, try this out. The quantum computer then prepares a specific quantum state that's called an ansatz, which is kind of like the quantum part of the guess. It measures the result, sends back its noisy answer, and then the classical computer looks at it and says, okay, that's interesting. Let's try this slightly different question. They just keep repeating this loop, getting closer and closer to the right answer with every cycle. 
But this isn't just some clever workaround. It's a sign of real tangible progress. We are actively learning how to manage, mitigate, and just plain reduce quantum noise, turning these theoretical machines into real usable tools that people can work with. And I mean, it has become incredibly real. This is not science fiction happening in some secret lab somewhere. You, right now, can get on the internet and run code on an actual quantum computer. Ever since IBM first put a quantum processor on the cloud back in 2016, access has just completely exploded. All the major players, we're talking IBM, Amazon, Microsoft's Azure, Google, they all offer these cloud platforms. They give you access to all different kinds of quantum hardware, letting researchers, developers, and even students experiment and really push the boundaries of what's possible in this noisy era. And look, it's not just about working around the noise. We are actively reducing it. The progress has been dramatic. Just recently, researchers hit a new world record for single qubit fidelity, getting an error rate of just one in over 6.7 million operations. That is a massive leap forward in quality, and it shows that we are steadily winning the fight against that decoherence problem. So what's the end game in all of this? All this progress, it's all leading us toward the ultimate prize, a fully error-corrected or fault-tolerant quantum computer. And the key to unlocking this future it lies in creating a new kind of perfect qubit. The idea is actually brilliant in its simplicity. Instead of relying on one single fragile physical qubit, you create what's called a logical qubit. This is basically a team of many physical qubits all working together, constantly checking each other for errors and correcting them on the fly. It's like taking our one vulnerable hero and giving them a whole squad for backup. Now, it might take thousands of these physical qubits to create a single super robust logical qubit, but once you do, you've basically conquered the noise. And we are on a very clear path to get there. I mean, think about it. Back in 2019, we saw the first quantum supremacy demonstrations. By 2023, we smashed through the 1,000 physical qubit barrier. And now, huge players like IBM and Quantinium are setting these ambitious targets to build the very first fault-tolerant systems based on logical qubits by 2029. The momentum is just undeniable. And when we finally get there, oh man, the possibilities are revolutionary. We are talking about designing new drugs and materials atom by atom, creating financial models that can handle a level of complexity we can't even imagine right now. And yeah, breaking the very encryption that protects most of our digital world today. But most profoundly, we will finally have the tool that Feynman dreamed of all those years ago, a computer that can truly simulate the fundamental laws of nature itself. So, from a simple, frustrated exclamation by a physicist 40 years ago, we've gone on this incredible journey. We've created a new kind of information, we've battled the dragon of quantum noise, and now we're right on the cusp of a truly fault-tolerant machine. The progress is real, the potential is immense, and it really just leaves us with one final, exciting question to think about. What problem would you solve if you had a perfect quantum computer?